So what I think what I'm gonna do, and we've got some time to spend in the garage, is if you remember, we tore up the welding job on the back of the parts trooper. We're gonna get that welded up, get that fixed, and then we have to head over to Matt Performance, the guys that are gonna make the uh, adapter plate so I can put the TDI to the bell housing on the transmission in the first place, but it's hideous. It's dirty, it's disgusting. It's gonna be poor form if I take that transmission to anyone looking like a disc. So we've gotta get that thing totally cleaned up. All right, so the more I look at this, the more I don't think it's gonna get any better. What we tore is uh, this piece over here, and there's no way for us to get it to line back up. So I might move this back over, as you can see here, and uh, try and just tack weld these two spots and see if I can just make something stick just so we can make this thing wheel around a little. So our little wizard wheel didn't do the trick, didn't take enough of the scale off. So we've got one of these abrasive discs. And we're gonna try and run this abrasive disc across this frame member here and see if we can try and get rid of the scale so we can at least get a decent weld so this thing will stick. <sighs> totally ground down the wrong side of the thing I did up here. Gotta do down here. Let's, let's do it again. I think that's what we're after. Now I know that this isn't really connected in the middle here anymore, but I don't care. We just need to be able to scoot it around the garage a little bit, move it back and forth. That'll be good enough. I think we're all set. Here's our transmission. It is an absolute unit. Huge, way overbuilt for what the truck is. And I'm not sure if that's because Isuzu, back in the day, used to uh, do a lot of industrial work. Maybe they just kind of took designs from some of their bigger trucks. But it is way overbuilt for 120 horsepower. Now, one of the reasons why it looks so big is it does have the transfer case attached to the tail of the transmission. Either way, it's disgusting. It's gonna be terrible if we deliver it to anybody this way. If I show up at MAP with this thing looking like this, they're gonna laugh me out the door. So let's get this thing cleaned up. Now I imagine a lot of you are going, why is he doing this in the garage? Why isn't he outside? Look at this floor, it's disgusting. Let me tell you something. It's 28 degrees outside, it's raining, and there's no way I'm hosing this thing down in the rain. It ain't happening. I may have shaved off probably about seven or eight days of my life, but the transmission is clean. So at least we got that going for us. This transmission's looking a hell of a lot better than it used to. No longer embarrassed to show up for measurements at Modern Automotive Performance. Um, one of the things I really like about this transmission is that other than it cleaning up pretty decently, just using like 76 cans of brake clean, is the Zuzu logo on it. And I love when people put their logo on things. It's just this, it's the sign of pride. You know, it's the sign of pride. We love this, we did this, we put our logo on it. And I just love branding in that way. It's very cool. All right guys, with the transmission clean, the trooper back on two wheels and two casters. I think it's time tomorrow morning we're gonna take the transmission and the adapter plate or the, the sandwich plate as you guys remember from the episode of uh, measuring everything. Down to Matt Performance, we're gonna visit my buddy Alex and see what they can do to kind of help us get uh, this adapter plate made. I'm not sure exactly what we're gonna do there. I know we're gonna probably 3D scan some stuff and do some magic. I hate magic. There's some guys down there that are way, way smarter than I am, and I'm hoping they're gonna be able to help us out. It is honestly pretty, uh, honestly pretty low-key awesome that MAP is here in Minnesota. This is a great company. They make so much cool shit, and now that Alex is here, they're making some really cool shit. 
the stuff that he's doing with 3D printing and uh, prototyping design is really killer. Really, really talented dude, Alex. All right, so I brought the adapter plate, the flywheel, the starter, and obviously the transmission. Holy shit! So this is our, it's called a fixture table, but we use it for 3D scanning because it's really rigid and really flat. This is our 3D scanner. It has a bunch of encoder arms in it so that you can 3D scan stuff relative to the table. And we put the transmission on the table. We'll scan that with absolute precision so that way there's no chance of it skipping targets or this moving around or anything like that. I love absolute precision. And uh, yeah, we'll get a CAD model of it going and. That way we can build a working CAD model of your swap. You know when your peripheral connects with an ethernet port instead of a USB port that you're using real hardware? <laughs> well, let's give it a shot and see what we run into. On a fun fact, um, this scanner is identical in every single way to the scanner that the Mercedes Petronas F1 team uses for their development. It seems very fast. It's incredibly fast. If you also notice, we haven't had to put any scanning spray or dots on this part at all, and it's dirty. So it knows that you're doing the inside of something right now. Yeah, it knows how to face the camera normal to what I'm scanning. So it makes it a lot more convenient for when you're scanning something complex and you need to look at the computer to make sure you're doing it right. Yeah, it's pretty turned up right now. It's at about 50% capacity. If I turn it up anymore, the computer will basically just freeze if I go over anything bigger than the size of like an apple. So we have to turn the scanner down for scanning larger stuff like this. And when we scan a whole car, I have to turn it way down because we just don't have the in-house computer stuff for that. All right, let's go over the scan and see how it looks. So, not most of it though, I think we've definitely got the bolt pattern, um, for sure. So, it's funny, you can see the dirt. <laughs> I'll have to grab more of behind this clutch fork, and in order to do that, I can take the handle off. I feel like a dentist right now, doing <laughs> operations on a dune sandworm. <laughs> so you said this machine costs Three Alfa Romeo. Yeah, it's about with software. It's about three times an Alfa Romeo quad quadrifolio used. <laughs> I like that measure of unit. It's a good one. What's interesting is there's no on this throwout bearing. There's no shims at all. Right. So there's no. We can't just no way to it. shim it. Right. Unfortunately. Well, that's where we get to figure out how thick we have to make the <laughs> the adapter plate. Yeah, we'll just scan it as a separate scan, and then I can turn it on and off in SolidWorks easily. It's all fully aligned to itself, so now you can see that there's where it was when we scanned it, and there's also, you know, where it is now. Which right. means in SolidWorks, I can just turn this scan off visually, and it'll show the one with it fully depressed, and then I can make a motion study in SolidWorks of it moving. Find out the distance. Yep. And I'd rather use the big scanner rather than just trying to pick a point with this on a circular face. Right. So so now we're going to do the uh, the fully clutch fully disengaged position so I'll have to zip tie this to something else. We're going to measure this distance because when we make the adapter plate the adapter plate is going to be that thick. So for the starter to be able to fit here, it's got it. We need to measure this and then have the starter be recessed into the adapter plate. Yep. Which is also why this is cool because it gives us some material for like this. Considering it works with this spacer plate in it, it gives right. us some material to actually mount the starter to. Because otherwise, we'd have to figure something else out. 
Or just have the Bendex, you know, do the one third contact and hope that it's fine. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. This project is so large that you can't, we can't think of what it's, what the part is going to look like. Right. We just have to think about, like, we have to make a working cab model of the end of the motor, this, the starter, and this. And then once we get to that point, we can actually look at everything. We'll go, okay, flywheel's got to be here, crank happens to be here, yeah. and all this stuff ends up here. Right. Now send that you off. You have to put it in the space. Correct. To be able to understand. Yeah, what nobody we need to can, do. I mean, unless they're Stefan Papadakis, nobody can think about that in their head all as a resulting system. We have to model it all separately. This scanner is in the in the millionths of inch. Okay. What, what is the human, do we know what the human eye is able to discern? Not much. When we're looking at this, like when my brain is scanning this, what is my tolerance for, for uh, measurement? That's a pretty abstract question, but I would say that from my time in designing parts and looking at them and going, yeah, that's about there. Um, I'd say like probably 60 thou, 60 to 80 thou is probably what you can just judge from looking at. It's still pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, you can go, I mean, this flange is only probably what, 100 thou thick. And you can go, yeah, that's, you know, probably about 100 thou. So, um, but yeah, you're, I mean, with a scanner like this, you're really taking it up a level in terms of being able to not just design a part that fits but actually can work on a mechanical device so like you know this input shaft has to be exactly in the center of all these bolts right and if it's not you're going to destroy your um your uh, whatever the bearing is called that's in the end of pilot it bearing. pilot bearing yeah. um, you're going to destroy your pilot bearing in like 10 minutes so it, it does have to be you do have to use equipment like this if you're working with mechanical systems. I would say that the ability for humans to see far beyond what we're able to see with our eye and be able to do stuff like this and have machining tolerances is probably one of the most important human inventions uh, that we power. have. It yeah. is, it's, it, it was the future. And during the Industrial Revolution, we figured out how to start making tolerances so small. Right. It became the greatest engine of human capability. Right, yeah, and there's a lot of people like me who have to dedicate their whole career to just going through all the data that these scanners make. So um, there's kind of a big misconception that it's like, if you scan something, you have a CAD model of it. Um, and that's completely the opposite uh, of what is true. When you scan something, you just have a bunch of points. Um, and best case, the scanning software will even give you triangles between those points. But in reality, a human still has to go through and create what's called a parametric or a changeable model off of those points. Um, and there's still interpretation there. So like I'm taking things, in, taking things in as a scan, like this circle, and I'm gonna make some assumptions, like it is a circle, and then draw a circle that's a best fit between all the points. The in points, reality, that's might, maybe not, might not even be a circle. No, in reality, it's probably an oval, it's probably got a dent in it. Um, so there's a huge misconception about people with, with a 3D scanner who think they can just go out and make something and, you know, Definitely go try, but uh, it's it's much more difficult than just than just point and click. Then what we're going to do is try to get the other side, and that might be like, oh well, you just flip it over and scan it. That's Duh. what I was thinking. Yeah. But what you actually do is uh, you have to stand it, or I like to stand it upright, and then scan both sides at once, and then I can take the scan of this side and the scan of this side and align them both to the scan of the whole thing. So that way I have full detail on this side, full detail on this side, and I know that they're both exactly where they're supposed to be in space. And you have to edge detail too. And I have edge detail too, so I have the whole thing. Because that way I don't have to guess if I align them correctly just by you know the edge features, which a lot of people would probably do. So we're gonna go the extra step and scan it standing upright. So uh, I'm just going to show you guys and Chris uh, pulling some mesh stuff into SolidWorks real quick. Um, it's not going to be a complete scan that's aligned or anything like that. What I've just done uh, while I was talking is converted the points into triangles. So these are no longer a bunch of points, it's a what's called a mesh body, which is like if you've ever 3D printed something, this is what you're working with, an STL mesh. And what I can do, because we have the software here to do it, is take that mesh and actually take it directly into SolidWorks and then work from there. 
Um, that's kind of where some controversy starts because classical engineer will go, well, you need your XYZ plane to be dead on and then draw for that. And more modern people with software will tend to work off just the scan itself, which classical engineers will frown at right now. Um, but I'll show you bringing it in and, uh, and some of the tools that we have to do it. This is a little project I'm working on. I'm making a uh, Walmart electric dirt bike very fast. <laughs> So this is the uh, 3D scan of the dirt bike in SolidWorks, and that's the battery box I designed. And the, the uh, let's see here if I can get the motor mount going. That's the fairing. That's the motor mount and everything. <laughs> so uh, like one of the tools we have for um, analyzing scan data is I can just come in here and choose, let's see here, pick some points. Obviously this is very rough, but just to give you guys an idea, I can pick some points and it'll give me the average flat face of those. And now I have some sort of normal to work off of that's probably pretty close to perpendicular on the drive, on the input shaft. Um, so like that's a super nice feature. Um, and then I can go through here and draw my holes and stuff like that. And um, if I wanted to do something like extract the bore of this bearing, I mean, you would ideally do it off the input shaft, which we have in another scan, but I can do something like grab the extract cylinder tool here, and then I can select multiple points. And then do you generally take a need cylinder. three points? Is that kind of like minimum? Uh, you generally need like a couple million points. <laughs> <laughs> I meant for but, what you're doing. What you're yeah, for this, I mean, you want to have at least like three sides of it. But um, then now we can go ahead and make an axis through this. And obviously it's the outer race of the bearing, so you wouldn't really want to use this surface. I'm not going to take this axis. Extend it. And now we have the center line of this entire transmission. So it's having tools like that that cost a good amount of money really helps analyze scan data. Um, and that's often what people forget is it's like, oh, I spent 10 grand on a scanner, I can do everything. But it's like, really, you have to have this software that's $10,000 and this software that's $10,000 and the plugin that's $10,000 and it, it all adds up. All right, guys, that's it. We're done. We're gonna go to dinner. Alex, thank you. I appreciate it as always. Let's take a ride in this STI. to do a pull but there's a challenger and we all know what happens when you do a pull next to a challenger <laughs> or charger whatever they're called it's a v6 all right guys that's it we're out of here like subscribe we'll see you next week